Yeah, let me let me give you a, a brief introduction if you didn't uh, read um, Melody's introduction. But as we said, uh, build a book for your business in 2022 is the topic we're going to cover today. And you know, you hear all the time, and I've heard it, you know, from you know ad nauseum from the beginning. They say build a book; uh, be, it'll be good for business. Uh, just leads you to more questions, more work, and and really the how and those kinds of things, in, in my opinion, become overwhelming. So really, how do you write that essential book that maybe helps your business to run your business, keep your sanity? And in this session, we're going to break down the idea of writing a book. And our, our goal today is really by the end that you'll know whether writing a book is a good idea for you or in your business, what to write about, how long your book needs to be, um, how to find the time to write and how to get started. That's where Melody is gonna take us here on this journey. Uh, Melody is the founder of Author Nation and a community of, where authors support authors. I like that. She has taught writing and communications on three continents and that's kind of a fascinating part of her story and helped hundreds of authors bring their books into the world getting in into hands of readers and she works with professionals and entrepreneurs to create books and other content that helps spread the message of business helping it to grow and to flourish melody is also the host of author nation interview show and a podcast where she interviews experts and authors every Thursday at 12 Pacific time. So that should give you a hint. Melody is not here in Dallas. She's actually on the West Coast. She is here today to answer all your questions and help you start your next project of writing a book or whatever it might be. So with that, let's welcome Melody Owen. Yay. Okay, Melody, you are up and I'm going to... Um, mute everybody else. And then if you uh, have a question or want to engage, then uh, either put it in the chat or Melody will, will call on you. Okay. Melody, you're up. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. So as uh, David was saying, we hear a lot about, you know, you should write a book. Um, you know, it's the new business card. And then we hear other things like books don't give you any ROI. So there are all these, you know, all these messages we are receiving. And so I want to clear up some of those. And I want to give you a new way of looking at whether you should write a book or not. And if you do, what you actually what, what kind of book you actually want to write. So to do that, I want to look at three myths. And then I want to ask, give you six questions to ask yourself. So I have dropped the link to the notes in the chat. So if you want to just get the PDF, you can grab that PDF. And if you just want to follow along, that's fine. If you are watching on the replay, you'll notice in my name, there's that tiny URL.com. That is uh, the PDF, the notes, so you can grab it there, whichever works. So again, we're going to talk about three myths and six questions to ask yourself. The very first myth I want to talk about might be a little surprising, and it is you must write a book. You, I hear that. It's the new business card. You must have one. It is an incredibly anxiety-inducing myth because the thought of writing 50,000 words can feel really overwhelming for some people. So I want to give you a new perspective on books. Books are content. YouTube videos are content. Podcasts are content. Blog posts are content. Videos are content. Courses are content. So books are content. So if you own a business and you do marketing, I'm gonna suggest you look at content marketing. I strongly advise you look at content marketing as one avenue to promote your business so that people can see who you are and what you're about. Does that mean that you have to write a book? No, it doesn't mean you have to write a book. If your people love watching videos and don't like reading, you will want to focus on video, not on the written word. If your audience spends most of their life in cars, driving, for example, from doctor to doctor to doctor to sell you know, new, new medicines, for example, they don't have time to read. They don't want to watch your videos. They're watching the road. They want podcasts that they can listen to in between uh, appointments while they're driving. 
So when you're thinking about content, think about who you are delivering that content to. And if they're not going to read a book, don't write a book. So you do want to have content. That's what I believe. I believe every business wants to have content. And if a book is part of that content, that's wonderful. One thing I would suggest is if you do have three years of YouTube videos or podcasts, that you look at that and say, now, could I repurpose that content into blog posts, articles, or even a book? And if you can do that, and that is something that is going to be worthwhile, then that might be a project you want to take on. So myth number one was you must write a book. And I'm going to shift that to, I strongly advise you to have a content marketing uh, strategy and plan and that you implement it. Uh, it may or may not include a book. Myth number two that I hear all the time, books have no ROI, no return on investment. And I again want to shift your perspective. So books can be products. And when people say books have no ROI, they're usually saying, look, I spent you know, $10,000 putting this book into the world and it sells for 20 bucks and I only get 50% of the royalties. So I only get $10 because I self-published. You know how many books I have to sell to make back, just to make back my $10,000, let alone earning money on it. Now, people who are saying that are looking at books as products. And yes, books can be products. But as we were talking about in myth number one, books are also content. So when you're thinking about a book, think about it as content. So if you're developing a book as content, then the time and the money you go into producing that book is now part of your marketing time and your marketing expense. And then what you're going to do then is say, so I do want to get this money back, but it may not be on the cover price of the book. I'll have to find another way to integrate the book into my business so that it does, you know, it's part of my content uh, plan, a content strategy that does lead to ROI of some sort, not necessarily the cover price. So myth number two again was uh, there is no ROI on a book. So if you are an author who wants to write a book and sell a book and you have no following and you want that book to be the only product you have, then I'm going to agree with you. There will be no ROI. I sometimes have clients come to me and they want to write a memoir and they want to make lots of money on this memoir because it's a great idea. And, and they're right. It's a fabulous idea. And I have to say, do you have a following? Are you known? And they're like, no. It's like, okay, so book is product may not work for you unless you're willing to develop that following of people who are mad cheerleaders and mad fans and will buy your book as a product. And so you can have a book as a product, but it's a big, big different story than a book as content. And so a book is content. You are um, using that book not to make money on it as the cover price, but to fit it into your business plan. And I think entrepreneurs and business professionals do this all the time. They produce content that fits into, their, fits into their business so that they can drive new traffic, so that they can get people to know, like, and trust them. And a book can be part of that. And if you're thinking about a book as content, then we don't have to think about it as a traditionally published 300 page or 50,000 word book. We can think about it as a 20 page booklet or e-booklet. So a booklet is usually up to about 50 pages and a book is usually over 50 pages. So sometimes clients come to me and they want to write a book. And when we sit down and talk about it, they're like, no, you're right. I want to write a booklet. It's a much more doable project and it's a way to start a book. So sometimes I have clients come and we land up writing a 30 page booklet and that's what they need. And slowly as time goes on, they add more and add more and add more. And it does become a bigger project and a bigger book. But because they've built up to that, they're building their book, it becomes a much more manageable product. So that is myth number two. Uh, books have no return on investment. And the third thing I hear is I don't have the time to write a book. I just, I don't, I'm, so, I'm busy. I need to fit it into my schedule somewhere. And I get that entrepreneurs, business owners, professionals, we are all incredibly busy, busy people. And it's really hard to find time to do anything. So when people come to me and say, I really want a book, but I don't have time. 
I have a couple of things to say about that. One, my first question is, do you have time to market your business? Do you have time to promote your business? Because if you have time to promote your business, if a book is going to promote your business well, then I suggest you make the time to write the book. So if you have time to promote your business, you have time to use content in that promotion plan. Um, plus, if you want to be successful, I often tell people, look, spend more time producing content than you do consuming content. People who produce content earn money. People who consume content pay money. They pay for that content. And so if you are looking to be an earner, then I suggest you work on a system that will help you promote, help you produce content. Because that's, if you think about all the big names and you know people who make a lot of money, they produce a lot of content. So I just have that mindset shift when you think I don't have time. It's part of developing you as a thought leader, as an expert, as a business owner. And then the next thing I wanna say about that is, you know, developing a book doesn't have to be you in the basement or the addict or wherever that might be, um, you know, alone writing a book. There are many ways to do it. You can teach a course or a workshop, record it, have it transcribed as an example. Um, I had a client who she taught a group session. She said to people, I'm recording this, I'm having it transcribed, and I'm going to uh, make it into a book. If you are okay with me including your pieces and your story and watching so people can watch your transformation throughout the book, please let me know. And there are people who are said, yes, yeah, sure, include me. So she taught a class, made, taught a, a group coaching or a set of workshops, made money doing that had someone transcribe it for her. She worked through it and edited it. And then she had an editor and she developed this amazing book. So how much time does it take to create a book? It depends on how you go about it. And there's some really creative ways to go about writing a book that doesn't sit you down in a coffee shop or your basement or wherever at your desk, hours and hours and hours alone and struggling with all of these things that uh, writers struggle with, like writer's block and imposter syndrome and, and all of those things. And again, you don't have to write a full page book right off. You can start with a booklet. So those are three myths that I find that people kind of get stuck in, in you know, uh, should I write a book or I can't write a book. And I want to know before I go on if there's anything else out there. Does anyone else have other blocks or obstacles or thoughts around writing a book that are getting in their way? And I would love to address those right now. I don't see any other opening. I will. I will just say that um, the the block that I find, and this is personal because I'm actually working through the process and have been for some time is knowing when to put a pin in it to, to basically say, um, I get the content and the, and the need to have it. Um, I've written, you know, basically a book or a booklet, a workbook kind of process. Mm -hmm. And now um, taking that content and incorporating into a book and then um, getting other content to put in. But um, with every day, there's more examples, more uh, things that, that I think of. And so sometimes for me, it's a challenge to say, uh, you know, the, um, the concept of perfection is the, the obstacle to progress um, or getting it done. You know, as I used to say, when I used to build car, you know, be in a car assembly uh, business when I work for General Motors is it's time to shoot the engineers and get on with production. Um, that's a challenge that I'm experiencing right now, personally. Yes. The, when the book becomes the monster, right? The, the book becomes a monster and it goes on and on and on. I'm, gonna, I'm going to say that two things you want to look at. One, you want to look at your why, your goals. Why are you writing this book? How is this going to fit into your life and business? And we're going to talk about these questions in a minute. But you know, why are you doing this? How, you know, why is this important? Who, and who is your ideal reader? And does your ideal reader want to read a monster? Absolutely not. 
So what are, when you have three stories to illustrate a point, what is the best story? The other two stories, keep them, tuck them away, and you can make them extra content or a YouTube video or a blog post, and you can put in your book for more stories, go to, and you can, then you get bonus content. And so whenever you start, whenever the monster starts kind of taking over, pick the one thing that illustrates your point and move it out or take, the, if it's, you know, there are five really important points I want to discuss, pick one and move all of the others to another book or to bonus content because you have more than one book in you. So if you find that it's getting a monster, say, okay, what is my super narrow focus on this book? And does this point fit? No, throw it out. Not forever, just, you know, into the next, next book pile. Does this one fit? Yes, it fits perfectly. Does that help at all? David? Helps a lot. It helps a lot. And um, I, I would like, you know, you to keep, keep going on, on the how to. So I, I yeah. think that's, that's really, because I think, um, I think some of the things to overcome some of the other types of mechanics of getting a book will probably be clear. Um, one of them is you're, you're getting into, which is my passion anyways, uh, your unique reason for writing a book and the value you're wanting to provide and the impact. Those are the three key areas of my vision challenge. So uh, I know those are also apply to the book. I'm certain not knowing you that well, but believing that. So take us there, take us there. Yeah. Sure. So um, I know we'll get to the six questions just a minute, but I want to add one more thing. So your book has one big idea, just one big idea, not five or six. You have you have a hundred big ideas, right. but your book has one big idea. And then each chapter has one idea that leads to that one big idea. Just one. And if you if you have one idea and it has you know, one big idea and it has 20 smaller ideas, you're not going to probably not going to write 20 smaller chapters. So just take half of them, take 10. That's book number one. The, the rest are book number two. And so each time you're writing in a chapter say, does this, what do these words right here, do they, how do they fit into this one idea that this chapter is, is uh, explaining, whether it's a story or a fact or a statistic or an illustration of something. And if it doesn't fit perfectly, remove it. And that will help you hard down things. And I'm not saying throw them out, remove them for later. So your book has one big idea. Each chapter has one idea that lends to that big idea. And so when I'm doing developmental editing, I'll ask, why is this paragraph here? Why is this paragraph in this chapter about this topic? And if you can't defend it, I'm going to say, why don't we take it out? Because your book's too long and we need to take something out. And this is not this is not a match for that. And that's really, that's really hard to do on your own, which is why people hire book coaches and developmental editors like me to go through and challenge them. And sometimes my clients really don't like me at certain moments, but in the end, they have a brilliant book that's the right length and has the right content and has the right balance of information and stories and exercises and, and whatnot, depending on what features are in that particular book. Does that kind of add a little bit more to? Yep. Okay, Very perfect. Good. Perfect. Any other questions before we move on? Oh, yeah. uh, hello. Hello. Yeah. I do yeah. have a question. I put my, my hand there, but that's okay. Let me Go just. Ahead, Doug. Oh, sorry. Just 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 okay. Minute. Number one, um, people tell me a book makes you an expert in whatever it is that you're doing. Okay. So yeah. you become an expert. Mm -hmm. But here's the, here's the catch all on this thing. Um, when I talked to several authors, they said, uh, be prepared to lose money on your first book. Your second book will start making you money. But you, uh, the first one, very few uh, authors can make money that book. So if you want to lose some money, make that first book. Then you can go to the second book. Yes. So here's my answer to that. If you are only going to write one book and you want it to fit into your life and business and be profitable, then you need to sit down and understand how it's going to fit in your life. And we're, that's one of my questions, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, now, if so, and, and I think that also ties into the people you're talking to, think about books as product. They're thinking that they can only make money off a book by selling the book. 
They're not thinking about how that book fits into their life and business in a way that they profit through other avenues. And so if you're going to write a book before you write a single word, that's something you need to deal with. And that's the first question. So with that, if you're okay with it, Doug, I will jump into those questions. And I think it'll help you answer your question even more. Good. So this, Perfect. This, is that okay? Yep. Okay, good. So the six, the six questions are to ask yourself before you write a book, whether it's a booklet that's only 20 pages or whether it's a 50,000, 60,000 word book. These are the six questions I suggest you start with. How will this book fit into my life and my business? Or if not your business, my hobby or, or whatever it is. How will this book fit into my life and my business? That's question number one. Question number two, why are you writing this book? Question number three, who is the ideal reader? That one person you're writing to. And, and I'll, get to, I'll get to that because I know people are going, one person, I want everyone to read my book. One person. What do they want to learn? What do they want to be able to do? What do they want to feel? Who do they want to be by the time they finish your book? And the next question is, where are they now? What are they doing now? What are they feeling now? What do they now know? Who are they before they read your book? And then question number six, what content will get them from where they are right now to where they want to be? So let's break down these, uh, these questions a little bit. So the first one will be, how would this book fit into my life and my business? I'm gonna give you some examples. Um, sometimes people come to me and they say, I want to write a book um, because I want to build an email list. And I'm like, that's, that's, a great, that's a great thing. You're probably not going to write a 50,000 word book for an email list. You're probably going to write a booklet and it's probably not going to be something you mail to them. So it's probably going to be an email, an, an e-booklet. So one reason you might want to write a book of how one way of, of the book might fit into your life is it might be something you are producing to grow your email list. Another way a book can fit into your life is to help you get found on search engines like Amazon. Yes, Amazon is a search engine, but people go there to search for things and then they land up buying things. And so one thing, you know, one way a book can fit into your life, and this is not the same, you know, e-booklet, uh, for, a, for a lead magnet, this is a different type of book. It'll help build your ranking in search engines like Amazon. And they aren't the same book. They may not have the same audience, these two examples. Another way a book can fit into your life and business is it could help you start or boost a paid speaking career. Right? So that's another, like, how it fits into your life. So in that case, the ideal reader is then a different person than the last two examples, right? And then I'll give you one more. Another, you know, how will this book fit into my life and my business? It's, I'm a coach. I spend a lot of time just telling my clients the little details or setting them up to do journals or exercises. So I really want a workbook so that at the end of each coaching session, I can say, okay, I want you to work on this next page, you know, 23. And instead of spending all that time on a live coaching call, it's right there in the workbook. So that when we are on coaching calls, they are power packed coaching calls because that's what I wanna give. And that will incredibly up the value of my coaching. And I may even be able to raise the prices of my coaching packages because I'm increasing the value of my coaching. So. Those are four different examples of how a book could possibly fit into your life or into your business. So let's look at why are you writing the book? So our first example was, it was gonna fit into my business as a lead magnet. So my why is I'm looking to build some trust. Um, I'm looking for people to like, know what it's like to work with me. And so these are people who have already been on my website. They already know who I am. They may have read some blog posts. And so I'm, my why is I want to get them from there to a place where we are communicating one-on-one -on -one or through the email so that I can offer them 
more services. So that's my why. It's to get people from browsing through my website onto an email list so that we can further develop the relationship. That's the why. So the second one we talked about was the Amazon, the search engine. And so for Amazon, this is a, if you want a book on Amazon so people can find you, this is a completely different reason. People on Amazon have never heard of you, have never been to your website. They don't know, like, and trust you. They know nothing about you. You're not working on that yet. You are just looking to be found. And so that is your why there. I'm looking to be found by more people. And by putting a book on Amazon, I can get found by more people. So my next way it's going to fit into your life was the speaker. And so for the speaker, um, you want to boost your speaking career or start a speaking career. And so what you want to do is you want a book that you can take to event organizers and you're writing it so that they can see that you have assets and they can, they won't probably won't read your book, but they'll probably look at the outline and they'll see what kind of talk you can give. They can see what kind of value you can give. Uh, and that's a much faster way than constantly sending them emails about, you know, what you can offer. Send them a, send them a book with a little note inside, uh, letting them know, you know, here's a gift. This is, you know, I have talk based on this. And then that gets you into the, you know, in front of event organizers. It also shows that you have assets to sell at events and event organizers often really like that. So that could be the why in that case. And then um, the, the other reason it was going to fit into your life or into your business was it was going to help you uh, reduce that, those like little bits of time you spend with coaches, with, sorry, with your coaching clients, explaining this and explaining that by creating a workbook so that you can amp up the value of each coaching session. And so why are you writing it? You're writing it so that you can reduce the time in coaching sessions on the little bits and pieces and they can do more work on their own and bring higher value to them. Um, so I'm going to do one more question and then I'm going to ask anyone who, ha who has any, any questions before we go on. So who is the ideal reader? So in the email list lead magnet, the ideal reader is someone who uh, already knows you. They've been on your website. They're curious about you. They may be following you on social. Um, they, they know what kind of problem you solve. They have that problem. They're looking for a solution and they think you might be the person. And they just want, they just, you know, they, they're looking to kind of build that relationship. They're, they're giving you their email. They trust you. They're, they're giving you their email and they're looking to see what value you can provide beyond, you know, what they've seen on your website and uh, on social. So that's your ideal reader right there. They, they are looking for someone exactly like you and they've been playing with the idea that you're the perfect person. So then the second example, which was to boost your rankings in the search engine, um, these are people who, your ideal reader, um, they're just, they're browsers. They're browsing through things. They're looking for things that are interesting. They have a sense that they, they have a problem they want to solve. Um, and if they see something that sparks their interest, they are willing to get curious and learn a little bit more. And so they, and they, they likely know they have a, a problem or, you know, they have a sense of what's wrong or they really know what's wrong and they're looking for solutions, but they know nothing about you. And so they're looking to find someone who they could possibly trust. So that's, that's the ideal client for the second one. The third one was the event organizer. So who's the ideal client? The event organizer and people who go to conferences. That's, that's, your, that's your target market. So they don't know you, but somebody is, you know, if the event organizer says, yes, yes, Douglas, come talk at our, our event, you are now, um, you now have a warm lead in the sense of people at the conference trust the event organizer to bring in good speakers. And so there's, a, there's kind of an automatic, you know, some trust built. And so you want the book to maybe build more trust or to help them lead, help you lead the conference um, attendees into a deeper relationship with you. The fourth one was the workbook. And so the ideal reader there is your, our clients, people who already love you, who already trust you, who are already in deep with you, 
and are looking for value from you, even more value from you. So those are the three first three questions. And those are four examples. Um, how will this book fit into your life and business? Why are you writing the book? And who is your ideal reader? Do we have questions up to now? If you have a question, go ahead and open your, your mic and I'll call on you. So um, anybody, Don or Ricky, Ricky just joined us, but uh, our singer songwriter yeah. artist is, is here. So Ricky, um, any, any questions or Don? If, if one of you wants to be an example and answer those three questions with me, I would love to do that. Go ahead, Don. All right, I can do that. Yes, yes, yes. So Don, you're thinking about writing an ebook or or an e-booklet or a book or a booklet. And how, if you did so, how would it fit into your life and into your business? Um, well, the uh, into my business, um, the book I've had in mind for a while is is a, a children's book. I'm an artist, I'm an illustrator, so I wanted to illustrate it. I wrote it when I was in uh, grad school. It was all about, uh, it's called Spuds from Space. And it's about um, potatoes that come from the universe and, uh, and land in the Andes and the history of the potato and the, this little boy that finds the spaceship and learns some neat things. Um, how does that fit in my business? It doesn't. That's why it hasn't been finished yet. Yeah. But um, I do love illustrating other people's books. So it could be uh, kind of a boost for that. So it could so it could fit into your business as an example of what you do. And it could fit into your life in the sense of it puts so you you've already written a children's book am i right you've written an illustrated i illustrated a friend's book it okay. was about a side it's called i am a sidewalk okay i am a sidewalk oh i love it it's about <laughs> concrete <laughs> yes i love it i love it i love children's books so there there's some choices here right there's mm -hmm. it could be it could fit into your life in the sense of this is something that i'm passionate about and i've always wanted to do it it's kind of like you know, why did I climb the mountain? Because it was there. Um, and if that's the reason you, if that's how it fits into your life and fits into your business, or if that's how it fits into your life, then you're not really doing it to make money or to fit it into your business. You're doing it because you're a creative and you're a passionate creative and you want to create something and put it out in the world because that, that in itself is there's deep intrinsic value for you. Yeah, that was the motivation for the sidewalk book and for my my potato book. Let's see, how do you get that in focus? Oh, okay. no. Yeah. Oh, the... it won't, it won't get into focus, darn it. I have to turn off. Yeah, sometimes so, you have to turn off the blur. There, so this is, I'm a sidewalk. That's beautiful. And my friend wrote it in high school in English class. And he published, he wanted me to illustrate it. I had great fun. I love drawing pictures. So it would be a chance for me to do my own thing, which I don't get to do as an employee, as a freelancer, as a business person. I'm usually working on someone else's dream. Yeah. And so, and that, and there's how it fits into your life. And that's your why, because I'm a creative and intrinsically I want to create and, and give my creations to the world. Um, who's your ideal reader? Well, you know, children of some sort, I would have to get deeper into the book to figure out exactly who would want to read, what, what type of child, you know, what, what the audience is, right? Um, that was a question as to, you know, what level is this written? Because I've written way too much. I actually started it. Um, I love it. From space. And I have, I have 20 pages here or more. Yeah. So of all this stuff that happens, yeah. and I'm pretty sure it's way too much. Maybe. Um, what I would suggest is I would do an analysis on the language to see what grade level it's written at. And then you, that'll figure out, you know, what, what age would be able to read it. And then you want to look at the maturity level of the content to see if it matches the age of, you know, if you thought if this book went into the schools, and this is one of the ways you can, you know, as, as an, as a children's author, one of the ways to get 
uh, to actually get paid is to, you know, get your books into schools and libraries and get grants. And, you know, there, there, is, there is a path for that. Um, but I'm, I suspect that that's not actually what your why. I suspect it's more of an intrinsic, I want to bring something fun and beautiful into the world. So for the ideal reader, I would analyze the language. Um, someone like me, uh, me or someone like me can do that for you. Analyze the maturity level of the content and, and the, the images and decide, you know, do they match? And if so, what age is that? And then you'll know exactly who your ideal reader is. And on top of it, you know, who's interested in, in spuds, right? Is this something that um, you want to then work with uh, a Spanish translator? and put it you know into because you know the potatoes from from peru right you know they have a potato museum in peru um so is that something you want to you know go down that avenue so i think there are a lot of possibilities here and it's a matter of really sitting down with someone and just hashing out all the possibilities and and figuring out do you know one what are the possibilities what really resonates with me and then do i want to do this knowing that you know, if this is a one-off book and I'm never going to do something like this again, I'm probably going to be investing more money than I'm making. Unless I have a really good plan to, you know, find a niche market and, um, and um, find a way to sell in, in bulk, for example. Right. Does that make sense? Uh, it does. I have no idea um, how to figure out what age it's written for yeah. or what to cut back out of it. It's probably two or three different stories in there. I know it's real long. Yes, yeah, exactly. Well, I suggest you- but I would probably love to, you know, do it all the time. I mean, it would be a dream as an illustrator to have your own character and series of books. Yeah. And, and I have a, a lot to share now, but it's not yeah. so much of it is on a children's level. Yeah, well, so, and, and, there, and there's another opportunity, right? How does this fit into my life? I want to become a, a children's illustrator for my books and other people's books, and I want to get paid for that, and I want to make my living off of that. And there are people who do that. It's not an impossible goal. It's one that you need to look at and plan for and figure out how to go from where you are now to where you want to be in, in that. And it's, it's, a, it's a career, you, know, you can project your career in that direction if that's what you want to do. But then that takes some planning as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It would probably be more of a retirement thing. Yeah, that's that's great. That's a brilliant way. I, I actually have a few clients who, you know, they're on their second career, right? They don't call it retirement. Just so you know, most people I know are like, I'm not retired. This is my second career. I am now an author. Um, now I'm doing what I want. Yes, Maybe Gabe and I can collaborate on a zombie children's book. Yeah, there we go. Hey, Ricky, did you have a question? I see you have your hand raised. I, I do. <clears throat> I have a, I've always had an idea uh, for a book and uh, being a storyteller and songwriter kind of thing. And uh, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out, would it be better to tell the story from uh, what I've seen or make it a uh, fiction where it's, it's not really me, it's a character telling the story? Right. Okay, great question. First off, I love songs with story. One of my favorite, my favorite songs are the ones that have that gorgeous story in them. So I just want to say kudos if you're writing songs. Uh, I, I, I can't write songs. Um, so you have a life event that is yours and you want to know whether to write it as memoir or not. Is that, am I articulating your question well? Yeah, uh, The what I've always thought was that in the late 70s, early 80s, and, uh, and as time went on, I was uh, involved in uh, factories and industries as a manufacturer's rep, and I saw those factories and industrial plants disappear, mm. and there were less and less and less, and it was it was a uh, it's a disappearing uh, thing for for items to be made in America, in the USA, and for people to have jobs. Yeah. And so uh, I'm, there's a lot of factors come into play there. One of them was uh, uh, overburdensome of the government with 
rules and regulations and when a plant got a factory got to a certain age they just gave up on it and just yeah. didn't didn't continue and of course things made overseas cheaper that was a, another thing but uh, right here in the north texas area there used to be probably twice as many food processing plants as there are now yeah i mean it's just like unbelievable how they just just went away so it, it sounds like you want to write a book that is historical in nature and um how you know so the question is how will it fit into your life are you doing this is this a passion project is this something you want is it fits into your life because it's so it's something that you that you love and you want to you want to put out in the world and you want other Americans to see. Look, this there this is a shift that we need to pay attention to, or is it something that will also fit into your business in some way? Like, how will this fit into your life? How do you imagine that? I I don't know. I I um I think maybe the very first uh, thought I have is that people don't realize this, right? And and that it's a bad thing, you know. Okay, yeah. It sounds to me like it's going to fit into your life. You have, you, you know, you have this, you have this message inside. It's like, hey, world, look, wait a minute. So it, found, it sounds like it's more about passion than it is about you making money off of it. This is what, you know, this is, this is what I, I'm, I'm taking from you. And so then the next question is, why are you writing it? And it sounds like you're writing it to wake, wake up America. It's like, hey, America, wake up. And so who is your ideal reader? Um, that's my next question. So if you, if, you want, if you want to write it to like more, you know, write it to more like a fiction, it's like, here's a fiction book about a real story and you're writing it fiction because it's, you know, that will really engage uh, readers of a, you know, of a certain, you know, age. You might be wanting to write to millennials. And you might want to tell them, look, this is what America used to look like. Think about that when you start becoming leaders and making decisions. And you could write that as a fiction book, or you could write that as from your perspective, you know, what, what you saw and then give advice on where you think we should go next. Um, and depending on who you're writing to, like if you're writing to millennials, maybe a fiction book will be more engaging for them. And maybe you, you can then somewhere in the book talk about the reality of it at the beginning or the end so that they can tie those pieces together. So I think you have some choices here and it's something you want to sit down and really, you know, talk through all the choices and all, you know, exactly who the ideal reader is and, and why you're doing it. If it's a passion project, again, you know, you may, you may or may not, you know, you, it, if it's a book as a product and it isn't tied to anything else, people don't usually don't make money from it. And I just want to be you know, upfront with you about that. If you do want to make money from it, exactly what I said to Don, you have to have a serious business plan on how you're going to um, maybe sell this book in bulk, right? What is it about the book that maybe a university would want so that you, you're, you're giving a historic, you know, an historical literature class or, or you know, a historical perspective on something? Then you have to write to that, that caliber, obviously. Does that, does that help at all? Yeah, I think that... Uh writing it as a fiction book would be harder but mm -hmm. probably yes uh, more people might read it yeah uh, and what makes me think of that is that back in i guess it was the 80s or maybe it was the 90s there was a guy that wrote uh some books from a spiritual perspective but they were fiction books yes. uh, uh oh shoot they were called uh this present darkness Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then there was another one uh, and but they were fiction books uh, but they captured you like if he just started telling you uh, the facts and figures and stuff of of the the spiritual uh, darkness that was that would be a lot harder to read than the s characters in the story this present darkness and piercing the darkness. Uh, I don't know if anybody ever read those, but those they are awesome books that uh, made you stop and they were fiction books, but they uh, made you stop and say, Oh my gosh, yeah, is that really happening around me? You know, that's what fiction's about. 
that that's exactly what fiction is about. So you've nailed it. And, and although you say, Ricky, it might be more difficult for you to write fiction. I don't know if that's true or not because I don't know you. Um, some people think it's difficult, but it's not as difficult as they think. Sometimes they think just writing what I know is easy and that doesn't turn out to be as easy. So it's it's maybe, right? Um, but yeah, it sounds like, it sounds again like a passion project. Um, and there are ways to figure out how to make money, but if it's a passion project, then make it a passion project. And, and that's okay too. We are creative beings. And if we want to create something, then then create something. And if you want to write a book as a change maker, then you want to sit down and say, okay, I want to write a book as a change maker. I want to change how people are thinking about the, the direction of, of, of America. And how do we do that? How do I do that? And then get, you know, I'd say get some good advice on that, but I hope that helps. Yeah, Melody, I think it kind of comes back to what you start, said very early on. I'm not sure if Ricky was on at that point. Uh, but when you are writing a book, and I'm not saying whether it's fiction or nonfiction, uh, the first thing is, what is the what is the point? What is the one thing that message that you want to convey yeah, in big. that in that book? Mm -hmm. So you would have to dissect your idea. Um, I could see, um, you know, I mean, now kind of thinking in a mastermind sense, because I know you and I know what your, where your content is and, and the songs you write and the audience you have is that um, one brilliant or could be brilliant idea is to take the message behind the songs that you've written, the story songs, create a journey for a reader um, and the point of the song ends up being the point of the book and um, your audience for your songs could potentially become you know vehicles for getting your book out because it's it's the same it's the message it's just making sure you understand what your message is and the point you're trying to make even with the song right you've already got all these songs that you've written um just a thought mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I just I'm just going to throw in there because maybe Ricky wasn't here. We talked about when you have something to say, you don't necessarily have to write a book. So you could be you know playing songs and talking about your songs and talking about the meaning behind them in in different avenues as well, right? Or the other thing that popped into my mind and people do make money. It's a big risk, but people do make money is screenwriting, right? What you what you're what you're talking about could be you know, a book goes, turns into a movie and you might write a book and then look for someone to buy options. I don't know if you know what options are. Um, it's the, we'll give you $10,000 while we, while the produ the executive producer tries to uh, come up with the money to create the movie. And if we come up with it within six months, you promise not to sell it to anyone else. And then if you don't, if we don't, when then we lose our option, you keep the 10,000 and, and, and you can go try to sell it to someone else. So there's, there's, that's an option as well. There, there are lots of ways to look at this. It's a matter of just learning what they all are and, and figuring out which way you want to go. But yeah, David, that was a really great idea, tying in songs. I mean, then that was what made me think of the movie, right? Because then your songs, would be, you know, the in the movie, right? Well, a lot of a lot of movies. And by the way, Doug, I see your hand, so I'm gonna I'm gonna call on you in just a sec, okay? I know you're on mute, but uh, I do see your hand. Uh, one of the things I was gonna say is that um, it's hard to monetize music right now. This is something Ricky and I have spent mm -hmm. time, you know, all the streaming stuff. But a good way in today's world to get uh, to get your, you know you get your music making money is as soundtracks or on you know screenplays or in games even you know depending i mean not necessarily uh or podcast ricky gene um you know i mean where your music is being socialized in a completely different um area and so and a book and or um you know, other content as Melody has been so clear to talk about there. Mm -hmm. So uh, Doug, are you where you can ask your question or are you, I, I, you're on mute by the way. So if your lips are moving and you're intending us to hear it, I think he's still going there. So, okay, Melody, what else? Um, any other, any other thoughts or anybody? 
I actually didn't answer one of Doug's questions earlier, I realized he said he was talking about people tell him that when you write a book, you're, you're an expert. Mm -hmm. I just want to, I just want to touch on this. Um, if you know nothing about a topic and you spend 10 hours doing research and you write a book based on a tiny little bit of knowledge you now know, you are not an expert. You've probably written a bad book. Um, if you've been doing what you're doing for, you know, 20 years or, or like Ricky, you've lived an experience and you've, you know, you've been following the news and you've been watching friends and watching, you know, towns, you know, fall apart and you've been watching it, then, then yeah, from your perspective, you are an expert. You may not be the, the economist or the banker and don't have their perspective, but thankfully you don't because you're, you have the perspective of, of the families who, who, you know, who suffered through that. And so what makes an expert, right, is a really good question. And that's something Doug asked. So if you, if you are you know, learning a topic and you are working in that area and you are learning it, and one of the things you're willing to do is to uh, do a lot of research to write a book that is high quality and in writing, doing all that research, you will become an expert. That's how, that's how you get your master's and your PhD. And you, there's no reason you can't kind of do that on your own in this world. So I just wanted to, to just make sure I answered Doug's question because it was a good one and other people might be interested. So Doug, are you ready or shall we move on? Yes, I am ready. And I will tell you what I'm writing about. And it's going to be to become a legend. Um, I will become a legend, they say. And then they're going to do a movie about it. But I will tell you that I want to get your uh, honest response, OK? Yep. Is that fair enough? Okay. I'm not so far. Let me lower my hand. OK, yeah. Anyway, I was in the Marines, OK? At, um, and I guess as soon as I finished high school, my father said to me, no, I was a parachute jumper. I was parachute champion, okay, at uh, 15 uh, for the state of Florida. And uh, so I got in the Marines. My father said, you know, everybody's been in a, in a service of one way or another, and you're no exception. In our family, everybody goes, okay. So I said, okay, I'll have to choose one. So I chose the Marines. So when I get there, the first thing they know, oh, says, you've been a champion parachute. We need somebody like you to uh, teach our uh, VIP course, okay, to our VIPs, all right, and so on. Um, and we we got high-ranking people that like to learn how to parachute. In fact, I had a general in one of my things. I can't remember the name. I'd have to go back. And I had a general. He gave me a hard time in the class, and I tell him, hey, throw you out of my class, okay? This is my class here type of thing if you don't... Um, it would keep quiet because he was making jokes all the time, you know. And I didn't think it was funny. Okay, so he stopped. Okay, but they had a few. So anyway, one night we were like a camp in West Hanoi, okay, in Vietnam, okay. And uh, uh, you know, I came over. No, they came. They wanted me to come over with my friend uh, to do a speech presentation. You know, they like to entertain the, the troops and so on. There's about five, six hundred people there. And so we came over, and I'm talking about parachuting, and he's, he's a fighter pilot, and he's going to talk about uh, fighters and stuff there. And that was great. So we had a nice dinner and a nice presentation. Everybody liked it. And it gets late. So about, um, about uh, I guess, 11 o'clock, he says to me, you know, we, you know, the guy who's in charge of the whole thing, I got a problem here, you know. They didn't realize there's something. I've got a couple of people out now that do watch over. So I said, I, I, I'll be glad to do the watch over for you, you know, and, or whatever, you know, take over. Well, he said, you, you're not trained in that, number one. And he said, number number two, you're not, you um, uh, you are a specialist in the area that you're in, okay? So, you know, type of thing. So I said, you know, nothing's happened, you know, I told him. Five or six months, nothing, you know, really gone hey, on. Doug, hey, Doug, Doug, um, I, I hate to, I hate to push you here. <laughs> We're running out of time. Can you get to your question or, or land the plane? And I, and for sure, um, Melody will be available to for follow up. Any of us would be. We're here every Friday, but uh, we are getting close to the end here. So, can oh. you kind of get to the question? Yeah, or... yeah. So they have. Uh, I anyway calls the headquarters and he says, yeah, you can do it for one day or whatever. Make it short. I went out there, and um, about 500 feet, there's a, a jeep there, and I see about 1 o'clock in the morning, all these guys are going to be throwing grenades into the tent, 
and you know, everybody's going to be in a lot of trouble. I see that. So I get on the, the Jeep. Well, you know, there's another Jeep 20 yards away. That Jeep has, has a problem because uh, it has a flat tire. Now, I didn't know to get to the other Jeep. If I was trained, I would have got to the other Jeep. That was, a little, you know, a few, they're taking it back. I did get there, but one grenade went off. Five people got killed, including my friends, okay, that was there with me at the time. But yeah. because of saving 600 people, they, you know, I was a, um, you know, I was given all kinds of medals, you know, honors and everything else that they would give. Yeah. And so now that, you want to make it a book, Doug? Now writing the book there. And then I wound up, my friend has a house real quickly. I'm saying in Las Vegas, you know, after, you know, I was my four years up. He says, come on over, live with us, me and my wife. We're just a newly wife in Las Vegas. I come over there. I don't know how to play poker or anything. And he says to me, well, we, you know, I went to a couple of things and I'm better, I'm beating them all, you know, judging everything. He said, we're starting a new program uh, on the poker champ championship on TV. I would love to have you go on there. You're that good. I said, I never played poker in my life. All of a sudden, I'm, the, I'm beating them all these guys. Uh, Doug, you know, they're poker. Yeah. This sounds like a memoir. Is this correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And do you have a very specific, do you have a question about the memoir? Do you, is there something that I can help you with? I just wanted to think what you thought about it, and then I wound oh, okay. up, you know, getting my doctorate degree, for the GI Bill, got my doctorate degree, and I taught college, and I got a, you know, mortgage and so on, and I've written a couple of books myself already, yeah. um, you know, so different yeah. stuff, um, tactical stuff, but just not, so I want to know what you think about yes. the book. I, so I, I think memoirs are wonderful. I love mm -hmm. memoirs, and, and they're, they're quite popular, and a lot of people love to read memoirs. So this, okay. you know, here's, here's, the, here's the thing. People who write memoirs, if you already have a following, people who love you because you're out in the public eye and you want to write a memoir and you want to sell it as a product and make money on the book, then, then you, if you have lots of people who already know you, you're a celebrity, people are following you, then you could, you could possibly do that. If you are an unknown person, and you want to make money, we want to write a memoir and invest in writing a memoir and then sell that memoir and nobody knows who you are and you don't have a following, you're unlikely to make money on the memoir. So if you do want to write a memoir, you want to think about how it's going to fit into your life. And if you want to sell it as a product, then you need to think, while I'm writing the memoir, how am I going to build the following so that when the memoir is done and out, people will actually buy the book? That's, that's my advice. I don't, one thing I don't want is people to jump into writing a memoir thinking that, you know, I've, I have the best story I'm going to write. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make lots of money because a lot of people have amazing memoir stories and it's all in the marketing at the, at the following in the marketing. So you, you must work on that probably even before you start writing the memoir. Okay. That's, that's, that's helpful. And, um, uh, I, how do you find a good ghostwriter? How do you find a good ghostwriter? Okay, my I I do not do ghostwriting, but my email is in the chat, and I know I know so many people in the business. I'm happy to help you find a ghostwriter. Yeah, and actually, Doug, in answer to your question as well, I my podcast guest yesterday on Warrior versus Zombie, that's what she does. She's mm -hmm. actually a ghostwriter. Yeah. So um, her name is Char Murphy, Charlotte Murphy. Okay. Right. So, Thank you. But there are, yeah, as, as she said, that that's that if that's 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 a reason I'm actually considering a, a ghostwriter myself just because I'm having trouble. I'm thinking about outsourcing it because I just can't, you know, I need to get somebody that can put it together. Uh, Melody, I'm going to turn it back to you as far as uh, any land the plane activities we got. We need a few minutes just to yeah. remind people what we're going to do uh, next week and so on. So uh, yeah, absolutely. So we dug into the first three questions. We dug into the first three questions, which were how will this book fit into your life and business? Why are you writing the book? Who is the ideal reader? The other three questions, just to remind you again, were what do they want to learn or to do or to feel or who do they want to be? Where are they now? What do they now know? What do they now do? What do they now feel? Who are they? And what content will get them from where they are now to where they want to be? And I think that's a good wrap up just to remind you of that. 
And remember that, you know, content, con we're, you know, we're thinking about books, you're thinking about content. Those are things you can build. You don't have to just run out and write 50,000 words the next month. You can build it up. You can write 10 related blog posts and then slowly build on those for a book, right? So think, you know, that's the key takeaway, right? A book is content marketing and it, content marketing comes in many forms and you can start small as a booklet or a blog post and, and build. If you have any questions, my email is in the chat. If you're looking for a ghostwriter, I can refer you to a couple and you can choose. Um, and I've also put Char Murphy's name in there too. I don't have her contact, but that's, um, that's it. Uh, if you have any, any final questions, please email me and I'm happy to answer them. All right, well, let me give you a hand here and, and uh, really a lot of good information there, Melody, and I really appreciate you, you sharing with us. Um, for those that are a regular part of the mastermind, uh, this will be shared in, uh, in, it'll be on the YouTube channel as well as in the uh, Be Connected Show channel. And I will post uh, the link to the worksheet that or workbook that she, pub, that she gave us a link to there, the PDF, as well as uh, her email and so on. So people can, can find you, Melody, it'll be out there on the channel. And so um, if you, I, you know, I can see, you know, I know, you know, I don't know, I just heard enough of Doug, Doug's story to say, yeah, there's probably something there. You just got to figure out what your expectations are and how you want to do it and what message you're really, there's probably, there might be multiple uh, screenplays or stories or things that you could create there with that. And the same thing with Ricky Jean uh, and Don, you know, I think that uh, there's not enough good ki kids books. And again, it's the same kind of thing. You know, what Melody said is, you know, what is the message you want the kids to take away from? And maybe it's something that helps parents get certain things across to their kids, or maybe it's something that, that drives them to your music, if it's a book like Ricky or whatever. So I just think there's all kinds, you've given me, uh, I, Melody, I really, really, really appreciate, you know, you sharing with us because you've given me all kinds of things pinging around in my brain about uh, not only um, what I'm doing, but also, you uh, people in this community. So, and again, I'm all about this year in 2022 is doubling my impact and my audience while doing it with half the half the time invested. So, so I have, some, and we have some big objectives in this group to do that. So with that, if, uh, anybody that's a regular part of this mastermind, if you have success, su suggestions on topics or approach or things we can do better, in our, you know, Richardson Plano or RP Networkers group, um, always looking for those ideas. Uh, coming up tonight, uh, I'm going to do it. Now, Ricky's got uh, going to be doing music, uh, uh, music Fridays. He and Denise tonight, I believe, at Porta de Roma, and then I think you've got something at a winery on Saturday, and then we'll be back on Monday for our regular weekly mixer in person. If you want to, if you're ready to get out and uh, have some. Uh, drinks and food and so on on Mondays. Uh, we are, that's become a part, one of the three meetings we do every week. Uh, we're getting good presence on Wednesdays. So just do me a favor and RSVP, you know, that, you know, for Wednesday, we're, we're running, you know, between 25 and 35. Uh, and we still have a contingent on the room in the Zoom as well in the room. So we're still doing that hybrid to keep everybody uh, comfortable that isn't ready to, to get out in person, um, and then this this weekly mastermind. So if you've got a topic and or um, you know some things that you'd like us to drill down on for your purposes of your business and others, uh, we're willing to do that as well. Any other uh, PSAs? Any other announcements? Doug, it's been great to have you. Um, I hope your your recovery and everything goes well. And again, Melody. Thank you very much. And Don, it's so great to see you uh, again, uh, both Wednesday and today. So I'm excited you're, you're back here. And I do want to uh, follow up with you. Um, Ricky, did anybody else have anything? Thank you for doing this. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. All right. Well, uh, we are officially uh, two minutes early to adjourn. So I'm giving you back two minutes of your most valuable asset, which is your time. And again, Melody, by the way, if you want to hear more of Melody, kind of hear her story and 
uh, her vision for her business and her her warrior journey. Uh, she's going to be my guest uh, on Warrior versus Zombie on the 27th of this month. So that'd be a week from next Thursday, I believe. And so we'll be I'll be featuring her. So you'll get to hear a little more of her. And you are in uh, is Vancouver, is that right? I'm in Vancouver, Canada. Yes. And thank you for having me today, David. And uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm I'm north. I'm north. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful place. I love Vancouver. I commuted there from Dallas for 14 months. So uh, I do know the the area. I do know the the and the